Hello everybody and welcome back to part two on the extended dynamic mode decomposition in our lecture series on the Koopman operator. Where we left off in part one was this linear regression problem that we had identified when we want to study an observable psi that can be expressed in terms of a finite basis. Okay, so this psi capital X was you know, a vector of basis functions evaluated at these x points and then multiplied by a coefficient vector a. So instead of general psi functions, let's say from a function space f, we are considering psi functions from a subspace fn that is composed of n of these basis functions, you know, which are collected in this dictionary or set of basis functions and then multiplied by these coefficients. And what we saw is that under these circumstances, the Koopman operator really becomes a matrix that propagates forward in time these basis coefficients, right? So the expression in the next time step is the same as the expression in the current time step and then propagated forward in time by the Koopman operator, which reduces to a matrix in this finite dimensional setting. And so how to solve this regression problem? This is our next question or task here. Um, and what I can do is simply define this in a matrix fashion and then use very standard techniques from linear regression, okay? So all I need to do basically is to define a matrix Psi X, which consists a bunch of samples. Let's say this is my Psi of X1. All the way to Psi of x m right, so um, what we need is m plus one samples in this case but this is you know, depends on how you, you name or how you name the number of, of samples that you have if it's a trajectory of m plus one samples which means you need um, you get m of these tuples, okay? So psi y is almost the same matrix, only every row is shifted forward in time by one time step, okay? So this is our basis functions evaluated at x2, and then our basis functions evaluated at x m plus one. So you see, both of these matrices are, no, both of them are matrices of dimension of m samples times n of these basis functions because each of these psi basis matrices contains n basis functions that we need to define ourselves. Hermit polynomials, radial basis functions, you name it. All right. And so what we can see is that this optimization problem is actually further simplified by using the Frobenius norm. So what we get is the Psi Y matrix minus Psi X matrix multiplied by this K operator. Okay, and Frobenius norm just means summing over all the entries, so exactly this. All right, so now we have written a problem that is very, very concise and easy to solve because it's rather well known how to do this in linear optimization. So the solution, what we see is we have a matrix, so we have K equations basically, but we often have a lot more samples than, um, or N equations, sorry. We have a lot more samples, so it's an overdetermined system. What we can only do is find the minimizer which means that we can simply use the pseudo inverse. Right? So if you see, this is sort of psi xk is equal to psi y would be the optimum. And so we can take the pseudo inverse to get as close to this as possible. So k, the matrix, is simply psi x pseudo inverse times psi y. Okay. So what this plus denotes is the 
Moore, Penrose, Pseudo, Inverse. So it's a generalization of inverting matrices, which is computed using singular value decomposition. And if you're interested in, I can put the link below the, this video to show where you can learn a little bit more about this. I will also put some references about the specifics, how to derive this optimization problem and how to solve this regression problem. Um, they're very, very nice papers. Um, it's called Extending Dynamic Mode Decomposition by um, Matt Williams, uh, Rowley and Kefrikidis. So I will put the reference uh, below the video. Okay, so now basically we're done. Only a few things maybe to consider. Now we have an M by N matrix. M is the number of samples that we have and N, capital N, is the number of basis functions that we've introduced. And now you can imagine small systems, few number of states, so maybe lifting this gives you a rather, let's say, acceptable, acceptably sized dictionary, but with long, long trajectories. So this case would be that the number of time steps is much larger than the dictionary size. And so maybe it would be better to replace this problem by a different one that makes, uh, exploits this dimensionality in a better way. And it can actually be done by using a couple of uh, identities for pseudo inverses. Right? You can find them in standard linear algebra books, also on Wikipedia. So what we will use is a, an expression for the pseudo inverse that the following identity holds, which is psi x plus psi x. Again, pseudo inverse, so the plus is always the, the pseudo inverse. Oh, excuse me, I've made a mistake here. Couldn't read my own handwriting. This is a transpose here. So psi x transpose psi x pseudo inverse times psi x transposed. Okay, so nothing specific to this uh, EDMD algorithm or dynamic systems for that matter. It's just a standard identity you can look up for pseudo inverses. And so what I can do is I can replace this one by this expression. And what I gain is, or let's just write it out maybe, psi x transpose psi x, pseudo inverse, and then psi x transpose psi y. Okay, and now we can give things new names basically, so we're going to say that this is, the, or not, not with the pseudo inverse, this, just this expression here is a G matrix. And now if you look at the dimensions, what we get is an N by N matrix. And we are going to call this the A matrix. N by N, okay? And so, well, Maybe let's write out what's what's happening here. The G, the G is just some k equal one until m psi of x k psi of x k transpose. So it's an outer product, you know, vector times the other one. Um, gives you um, really, sorry, I guess due to my notation, I need it like this. Um, this outer product gives you this matrix. Well, you can also average it over the number of samples. It doesn't really matter because this would cancel out. But you get this very straightforward calculation to give you this matrix and you get a, an equally simple uh, correlation here where you have instead of the psi xk, the psi of xk plus one. And calculating the pseudo inverse of this much smaller matrix is a lot more efficient. So this is advantageous in the setting more snapshots than dimensions. And for those of you who know a little bit about 
proper orthogonal decomposition, this would be related to the method of snapshots there. Okay. Also, if we're talking about finite elements, this would be some sort of a mass matrix and a stiffness matrix in this context. Okay. Before we conclude with a short example, the second case um, where this is the opposite. And if we think about fluid dynamics and we have a few snapshots and we have a large state space that we want to lift, then we need to go another direction that we are going to discuss, discuss later, which is, sorry, a kernel method. So there's a kernel version of EDMD that allows us to take into account you know, inner products with a kernel uh, by def defining a kernel and then not explicitly lifting to this large state space. Okay, so let's study a small example and then we know a lot about the Koopman operator. Next video is then going to be about the question how to approximate eigenfunctions, eigenvalues and these Koopman modes from the K matrix that we have now found. But for now, this was the data set that we collected from the Duffing system, if you recall from the last video. And we then lifted all the samples using Hermit polynomials. So this is the basis in 1D and we can take products for raising this to a 2D basis, so two-dimensional input. And we get 36 of these basis functions, so products in between the two, which allows us then to calculate EDMD in exactly the way as I have set it up here. Right? So if you look, this expression here is exactly the one I've written here on the board, only here we have the pseudo inverse. If we take this matrix, we make sure that it's symmetric, so quadratic, and we can take the inverse, which is, gives us the same answer here. Pseudo inverse, um, numerically slightly more stable, but for this one it's sufficient. And so what we get is this K matrix, and what we can define is the projection back onto the state space. So we've lifted our X into all these Hermit polynomials, and what you can see is that the third entry would give you the first component, so the x1, and the second entry would give you the second component of the state. So this projection matrix takes you back from the lifted space to the original state space. And so b times psi gives you x back, exactly. And so what we can do now is we can study the prediction accuracy. So what we are coding up here is, um, 1,000 test trajectories of length 20 and then we simply pick random initial conditions in a box between minus 2 and plus 2, uh, integrate the wrong cutter scheme, so this is our exact data and we then have a test set. And so what you see here is the Koopman predictor which is simply, right, is, is written slightly differently to what we have written here because in the code the psi is a column vector whereas our definition of the psi was a row vector. And so k transpose times the column vector would be the same as the row vector times the k matrix. Okay? So nothing but you know, transposing the, the dimensions. And so what you see here is the forward propagation of these psi's. We do not need the, I, uh, the a coefficient here because you know, this can be repeated and repeated and repeated. And all we need in the end is the projection back onto the state space. And so this is what we do here, simply the xk is the projection, so b times the psi, and this gives us our state trajectory in the predicted space. And so what we can do is we can, since there's a thousand trajectories, we can compute the two-norm error over time and then compute the expectation by simply averaging over all our uh, trajectories. So what you see here is the expected or the mean prediction error um, for the dashed line, this is the expected value, and you see here in, in colors, not the expectation, but five exemplary samples. Okay? So this is the, the two-norm difference between the states, and here are two more plots which show you the first component, the true system, and the predicted system, and so you see uh, clearly we do not predict perfectly well, but okay-ish, let's say. You see here yellow and yellow, and so this is the second component. So we clearly see there's an inaccuracy, but it's also capable of predicting a couple of time steps ahead. And if you think about a nonlinear system that we can now predict using a matrix vector multiplication, this is 
a huge advantage for practical algorithms. Of course, we need to be careful about the approximation accuracy, and we have discussed this in a lot of detail in the previous video, where we talked about these Koopman invariant subspaces, and so clearly this is violated here, and this is why we do not get a perfect prediction. However, I think this is a good tool to start with, and it can be further used for analyzing eigenfunctions and decomposing your system into linear eigenfunctions and, and dynamics along these eigencoordinates. Right? Again, in an approximate manner, but this is what we're going to study in the next video. So thanks a lot for your attention and see you then.